Hello. I am very excited to be here. I've already had excellent, excellent conversations with many of you, and I hope to have more afterwards. And we can even talk about something other than buttermilk pancakes, if you'd like. But a lot of you don't really know me that well. This is kind of a new crowd for me, so I appreciate the introduction. But just so you know a little bit about where I came from, I started back in the 1980s at Apple, where I worked on System 7 and Newton. And then I went, I consulted for a little while, and then I went over to Symbian, where I was director of product design, and then eventually consulted some more, and then went to Google, for where I was manager of mobile UX. But I left that, and in the last year, I've been at Frog as a creative director. And so I've kind of spent most of my life in mobile, and it's something I think a lot about. I think I'm very passionate about what more mobile needs to be going. And what fascinates me most is how we think about mobile. Where are we going? What's important to us? Because to a certain extent, we've had this steady progression from mainframes to desktops to laptops to mobile phones. And we're always kind of obsessed about what's coming next. And back when we were thinking about mainframes, the idea of a mobile phone would seem crazy and ridiculous. And it would have been hard to imagine. And yet here we are standing with mobile trying to figure out where we want to go. And whenever people talk about the future, they often talk about such trivial things like speed, size, and cost, because that type of prediction is incremental. It's pretty obvious that things are going to get smaller and faster and cheaper. It's the big, ch the big changes that always make us kind of stumble and try to figure out where we're going. I've actually written about this before, and I'm always fascinated about kind of the sociology of technology and how we grow and how we think. And I've written previously a couple articles about this called Default Thinking. And it's always kind of fascinating. It happened with television. When television first came out, they had this amazing new technology. And what did they do? They literally, I'm not making this up, they literally read radio plays in front of the television. That's just how they started. And then they figured it out. But it's just this classic idea that whenever I get a shiny new tool, what do I do? I turn around, and what I was doing on yesterday, I start applying that tool to what I was doing. It, it takes a while for us to figure out what to really use a new technology for. And I think mobile is a lot of it the same way. Now, after having written about this and thinking I was pretty, pretty proud of default thinking, as my own little phrase, I was pretty, pretty proud of myself, like so many people, I discovered that Marshall McLuhan said it a hell of a lot better than I did back in the 1960s. We look at the present through a rearview mirror. We walk backwards into the future. Isn't that beautiful? I love that sentence. And it just reflects how we tend to go. We as humans naturally stumble into the future. And it's not something to be critical about. It's just who we are. In fact, I think it's why designers like to prototype so much. Because we know that we have to, we know what we, we don't know what we don't know. We have to stumble a little bit and figure it out. And that's just kind of the way of all technology. But in mobile, I think we're kind of stuck in a rut. Where are we really going next? So in many ways, it's like, what is our perspective? Alan Kay has a lovely quote. Perspective is worth 20 IQ points. And really, what should our perspective be? Where do we want to go with mobile? So my career was, like many of you, you just kind of show up, and you just want to just feed your kids, and you just kind of work your way through. And I eventually had my perspective shift. I started off working on System 7, and then I started doing a little bit of work on Newton. I worked on that for a while. And eventually went to Symbian, and I worked on a couple phone concepts there. And that's kind of my OS phase. And that's when I was working you know, on operating systems. And then when I kind of came to Google, I started working on, on apps. I was very lucky to be working on the very first version of Google Mobile Maps and Gtalk and Gmail, and that was kind of my app phase. And then eventually I came and started working on uh, web, the web apps in HTML5 and JavaScript. And that was when I really had my perspective moment. That's when I really felt that something shifted, and something changed in a pretty deep way. And what happened was, this is a simple little problem. I, I don't want to tell the story t in too much detail, but we were having a problem with the Android browser. When people were clicking on links, they were missing. They were not hitting them properly. We couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And it was working perfectly well with the iPhone. Um, so many things with the iPhone are really well thought out, and you don't appreciate it. And we were like, what are they doing? What is so magical about it? So what I ended up doing was, I wrote a really simple little web page that was meant to be run on both iPhone browsers and Android browsers. And it asked a little question, like, what age are you? And then it ran through 10 small screens 
where what we did was um, just had different size buttons. I had four different sizes, and people just had to tap them in order. And whether they hit it or not, I didn't care. I just simply recorded whether they hit it or not. And every little tap was a little post to a MySQL, MySQL database. And I just recorded it. And I was petrified that people would not make it through, because it's, it's a pretty boring exercise. But we, we had to capture this data. So I always had this little kind of comment at the top, you know, eight more to go, seven more to go. I was just trying to encourage them to go on. And uh, I, was, I was sure that no one would make it through. It would be too boring. So after they got to 10, I did a f I wanted to get f five more times, and so what I ended up doing was made slightly more obnoxious comments as they went along. You can stop now, really. Dude, you're starting to worry me. They have pills for this, you know. And I can't hear you. And eventually, I just redirected them to google.com, and well, everybody <laughs> went through all 15 pages. It was very funny that a little bit of humor clearly goes a very long way in making people do very, very tedious things. Um, so that was my rough prototype, and I worked on it really hard, and I made sure I was all working, and I sent it out to a Google internal email list and crossed my fingers. In one hour, I had 90,000 points in my database. It was really frighteningly how quick I was able to get a tremendous amount of data. And then what I did was I wrote a little tiny uh, application in, in uh, Chrome, which basically would take the data and visualize it. So here I'm taking the iPhone, the, the 50 millimeter size, and there's the points that got hit, and those are the points that didn't get hit. But I had so much data, I implemented this heat map, and I could see the contrast ratio of how many points got hit more often. Now notice this point, this is where the iPhone is right now. I'm gonna switch over to the N1 at the time and plot that data and see where the weighted average is. And you ready? It goes boom, it moves down. And that was our proof that we were having a problem. And then I could play with the contrast. It's just fun to move sliders. It's just a toy, but it's really fun to play with. And then I could then slice and dice it by age data, and I eventually from the 20s to 30s. And as people got older, do you see how the weighted average moves down? And so we could, this was a very effective tool at proving to the, what, what happens in Amsterdam stays in Amsterdam, right? The, the Android team was pretty grumpy and wouldn't admit this is a problem. And so I had this data, and it was pretty conclusive they had a problem, and so we got them to admit to it. But whether or not this was effective isn't my point. My point was I was having the time of my life playing around with JavaScript and HTML5 and, and Canvas. And I really felt that something profound had just happened. I had spent a week creating this thing. I sent it out to a little teeny little mailing list within Google, and I had 90,000 hit points. And then a week later, I had this tool where I could show this to everybody, and it worked on my laptop and my PC and my tablet. It even worked on my phone, for God's sakes, so I could be anywhere and I'd show people this data, and I could send the link to this, and people could use it. And I got a lot of traction internally with this. And I wasn't quite sure what was happening. I couldn't quite talk about it, but this was my perspective shift. I knew that the world was changing in a way that I couldn't quite, you know, finger. And so I, I started thinking about what this really meant. And so it's kind of what led me to writing my mobile apps must die post. I, I wrote it after I spoke at Breaking Development last fall, and it's been kind of the, my primary meme that I've been pushing. And it's not like I really want you know, native apps to die. In fact, there's a little problem you have when you, have a, when you write a blog post that clearly, I will admit, has a link bait title. I'm sorry, I will admit that I chose an inflammatory title. But it got a lot of readership, got a lot of traction. Um, it was kind of fun, the day I published it, Frog's website got four times its normal uh, traffic, so I felt kind of fun about that. But um, the, the problem is that people think that I am in this web versus native debate, that I hate native apps and I want web to win. And, and that's the problem with the link bait title. People put you into a box. And what I'm about is the fact that native apps is not the only hammer in the toolkit. I want the concept, the desire of using native apps to die. I want there to, th to be other possibilities. But of course, that's a subtle point. And in a world full of YouTube comments, it's kind of hard to be subtle sometimes. So let me quickly summarize this overall point of why my perspective shift led me to this idea of mobile apps must die. There's three trends that I see happening in mobile that are coming, and I think that they're going to profoundly change our world over the next couple of years. The first is what I'm calling app glut, and how applications are kind of affecting us and how we're using applications. Is it really the case that we are going to have an app for every store we walk into, 
every product we buy and for God's sakes, every website we visit. I mean, at some point it just breaks down and yet somehow people just think we have to keep pumping out apps. That's the solution, just more apps is all we need. At some point, the user becomes the bottleneck. This is a slightly rhetorical question, but how many of you in the last couple of months have gone through your phone and deleted all the crappy old apps you don't use anymore? Of course. We are gardening our phones, right? We are, somehow the phones have tricked us into being the caretaker of their well-being, and we're managing them. It's a little weird that that's going on, and yet somehow we don't quite think about that. Here's another one. Have you ever gone into a store, and they have a sign pro you know, proudly saying, we're in the app store, just download us. And you go, I can't be bothered, you know? We've all done that too, right? For Frog, we do research to find out product opportunities. When you hear someone say, I can't be bothered, that is design gold. You kill for that kind of observation, and this happens every day for us there's something really profound happening with the fact that there's what I call this thin crust of effort that forms around applications. And we just seem to be accepting it. Now, whenever I make this point, people you know, in the, the blog comments kind of go, yeah, Jensen can't really deal with a couple of apps, har, 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 the guy, you know. And it's like, that's not my point. The point isn't that we can't deal with it now, but where are we going to go? What happens if we have 50 more apps, 100 more apps, 1,000 more apps? At what point does this break down? What this is all about is like a fundamental UX principle I call value must be greater than pain. It is kind of a design axiom that applies to almost everything you do in design. Uh, the, the example here is when SMS first came out in the 90s. It was horrible. It was a really difficult user interface. But the value was so high, it was worth it. So value was greater than pain. It's not to say that you want to ship a product that always has high pain. I'm just saying you can get away with it. And you very rarely have a situation where value is that high. So that's, in that particular case, value was the primary driver. On the flip side, uh, about in the same time in the 90s, Google decided to significantly reduce the page weight of Google.com. And what it ended up doing is it reduced the load speed, the load time of Google.com by four tenths of a second not even sub, you know, consciously discernible, and usage went up considerably. So in that case, all they did was reduce pain, and they improved the product. The value was identical. And that's kind of the flip side of this value. So this, this, this little inequality can be used in multiple ways. But what happens is that whenever we go to a conference and we talk, I always find that everybody only talks about value. Value is all we can talk, it's the feature, it's what it's going to do for you, and it's understandable. It's the, the, the basic thing that's driving what you're trying to offer people. But as a designer, I'm always worried about pain. That's my world. I'm, I'm constantly trying to reduce pain. And I find that's kind of the subtle difference between sometimes you know, marketing people and designer people. You kind of have to do that. But the really subtle aspect of value being greater than pain is we can talk about value being higher than pain and reducing pain a little bit, but the really, I think, insightful, subtle aspect is if pain goes down to zero, if it gets really low, value can go down to zero. And we can start to do things that would normally be considered ridiculous that you'd never do, but you'd actually find it possible if it were really easy to do. I call this the triumph of the mundane. It's my last blog post I wrote about. And especially when we get to smart devices, trivial things become doable if you make them easy enough, which leads me to my second trend that there's this incredible size and cost reduction that's happening right now with smart devices. Processes are getting cheaper. You can start to get a Nordic controller chip with Bluetooth for like, what, 25 cents? It is becoming quite, quite cheap now to put interactivity and smarts into products. And so there's things like the smart TVs, we know that. This is the SensorWare chip from uh, FedEx. You can put it into your package and track it. It can track temperature, and even when you open the package, it's got a light sensor, so it knows when it's been opened. Uh, this is a track stick, which is a GPS device. You just throw it in your backpack and you take pictures all day. And when you plug it back in, it synchronizes with your photos and geostamps everything. Uh, this is a Pokin. It costs like $3. They put them at conferences. They help you exchange contact information. And this is a really fun one called Glowcap. It's a pill bottle. And if you forget to take your medicine, it calls your phone. 
um, which I think is really clever, right? And, and there's just all these little things that are happening, right? And, and there's going to be lots more of them. And it, what's, what led me to write, actually, a year ago, my first blog post called The Coming Zombie Apocalypse of Smart Devices. This is an exponential trend, and it's going to continue to grow. And as Kurzweil talks about in his singularity, humans think linearly. We don't really understand an exponential trend. So when he, they predicted that the human genome was going to be sequenced in 10 years, at year seven, they were only 10% done. And everyone's kind of like, ah, ah, you're not going to finish. You know. But of course, they finished just, just fine, because the exponential you know, curve, they were able to get the computers fast enough, they finished plenty of time. So what's happening is, when I talk about smart devices, it seems absolutely crazy until it becomes completely obvious to everybody in the room. Right? So there's a certain trend of smart devices coming that's not quite immediate, but it's starting to form. It'll become much, much bigger over the next couple of years. The third trend is that these cheap smart devices tend to leverage other platforms. They're cheap. They can't afford a 10-inch tablet display. So in this case, we have the Sonos. I actually have this in my house. There's the Nest controller, and here's the Withings bathroom scale. This is a Wi-Fi-enabled scale. A truly frightening thought, actually. Um, but these actually all have iPhone apps that you install, and it offloads a significant amount of the functionality, so the devices become clean and beautiful, and they, they only have to have a couple little things on them. Of course, this is now starting to show this problem, which is I have the Sonos system, I'm very proud of it, and I can use it, but my wife can't. So I've got to go install the app for her, which is a little bit of a trouble. My son doesn't have a smartphone, so he's completely out of luck. He can't do it. Or imagine if you were at someone's in an office and you had a smart printer, and now everybody in the office has to have the app. It starts to break down really quickly. But you can still see what people are doing, that, that they're trying to get the functionality off of the device. So what do these three trends combine to make, right? If we know that there's this thin crust of effort around apps, it's getting harder and harder. And yet, we're getting lots of new smart devices that require more apps. That means we've got a problem. It, to a certain extent, these things are going to grow and overwhelm us. And I'd like to think that we've seen this before. We keep revisiting and revisiting our history, and we don't notice it. I mean, remember back in the 90s when Yahoo really thought it was cool to have a fixed set of hierarchical links to navigate the web? Wasn't that cute? Yeah. The fact that you could just simply have this fixed set of links, and it just became insanely goofy after a while. And Google came along and said, screw that. Just give me a search box, because there's just too much stuff on the web. I will go fetch it for you when you need it. And, but it's, it wasn't just simply enough to find all the web pages that contained the word Scott. They actually had to rank them. So like, here's the first 10 pages that you most likely want. So that, to me, was a fundamental shift when you go from a fixed set of things you start adding hierarchy, like folders on the launch screen, first sign, and then, then you realize that you're starting to build too much and things will start to break down. So I feel like we've seen this pattern before. So how would this play out? I've talked a little bit about smart devices, and I actually, in my Zombie Apocalypse article, I talked about three different categories of smart devices. But let's just talk about the one I call the opportunistic cluster. It's the devices that you will see as you walk through your day. So I'm in front of a movie poster, and it's got a little RFID chip in it. And I can see a, a video, a preview of the movie, or I can see where it's playing, or I can buy a movie ticket. Um, or a bottle of ketchup in the store. I can open it up and I can kind of instantly see the platonic ideal of ketchup, you know, everything about this bottle of ketchup, right? But then if I want to, I take it home and it has history and I can kind of see when I bought it. If it has a cheap sensor in it, how many times I've used it. When it expires, it can help me buy it again. This is exactly, by the way, Bruce Sterling's spime concept. I will admit to stealing that freely. But it's this type of idea of objects become smart and start to help me out in subtle ways. Or I go to a tennis court and I want to turn on the lights or get involved in the ladder. Or I go to a bus stop and there's no technology at all. It's just simply a geolocation. But I know that when I'm near it, that this bus stop represents bus 13, and I know that the next bus is coming in three minutes. Or I go to a, 
say, a restaurant and I want to turn on the jukebox, or I'm in a mall and I want to see a map and find out where security is, or I go to a hot dog stand and I want to see when they're coming back next week, or a zip car and I want to get in. These are all examples of smart things that are coming. People have all talked about this. Frog has worked actually on multiple projects up with clients already. These things are coming, and how would we want to work with this with a mobile phone? How would that work? And to a certain extent, they're all using effectively the sensors that desktop computers don't tend to have that enable the phone to kind of in, you know, see the world around us. And what I call this is called, I call this just-in-time interaction. I want to go up to these devices and I want to use it and then lose it. Right? I don't want to use, I don't want to download the app for this poster and then use it for the next 75 days. I want to use it one time. It's single usage. Applications completely suck at this. Okay, this is not what applications are good at because the thin crust of effort becomes much, much thicker. We've got to figure out a way to have this be dynamic and quick and fast. This quote, I think, means a lot here. Because what are we doing? We keep using apps as the same thing. We, as the mobile web community, keep trying to be and you know, emulate apps. We are doing the same thing and expecting it to be different. To a certain extent, we do need a paradigm shift, a different way of looking about this. By paradigm shift, by the way, I'm referring to Thomas Kuhn. He had the structure of scientific revolution. It was probably the densest, best book I read as an undergraduate in college. And the Kuhn cycle is a very simple idea, which is there's a certain way in which we have revolutions in scientific thought. We start off by having normal science, and then we do experiments, and the model that we have isn't quite working. The data doesn't quite work. And then it leads us to a model crisis. Things aren't, we know we have a problem, we're not quite sure what. We then have a revolution, we find new models, and there's a huge argument about it because 90% of everything is working just fine, thank you. There's just a few people that are having trouble, and there's a huge fight between the established thinkers that say, it's not a problem, and the 5% that say, we gotta figure this out, right? And so it's a huge fight, and it's always kind of bloody and crazy. And, of course, the poster boy for this is Galileo, who discovered the Jupiter moons. But in many ways, I'd argue, what is our model crisis? You know, what is going on right now? What do we need to do to break out? And to me, the model crisis is the fact that all we can do is aspire to be kind of as good of native apps. Isn't that exciting? to aspire to be kind of as good as native apps. That's our big goal in this room, right? And so every time we improve a little bit, it has to go through standards bodies, and we always kind of try to figure out how to make it work in Africa, and if it can't, then, then we gotta can't do it, no way. And then it's like, it just takes forever to figure this out, and then by the time we finally get around to it, those guys have moved on. So, in fact, I would argue that we'll never catch up, we'll probably get behind faster. <laughs> we'll get more and more behind as time goes on. We've got to stop, as Horace was talking about, doing a frontal assault on this problem. We cannot think of the mobile web as the killer app of native apps. It is the wrong model. We've got to go where native apps can't go. In a sense, it's like our perspective is, how do we get beyond mobile? How, what is our flanking maneuver to kind of go do something else, do something that Apple isn't even thinking about? And I feel we've got to play to web's strengths and do things that native can't possibly do. So, in order to do that, whenever I talk about smart devices, I think people frequently get tripped up on a couple of things. So I want to talk about three things about smart devices that I want to really emphasize a little bit. This kind of came from my uh, triumph of my mundane post last week, that it's really important to understand to get our heads wrapped around this. The first is the fact that whenever we have a smart device, we're so used to thinking in terms of CTIA, CES, iPhone, iPad, big stuff. We think that every device has to be awesome and huge and do everything. We're not talking about iPad-level functionality. We're talking about a smart movie poster. We're talking about a smart toaster, which is intentionally kind of a joke concept, and like a smart power adapter. When it, it takes you a nickel to you know, put some smarts or a web server in these devices. I'm going back to my value versus pain point. It becomes really, really cheap. Now, let's say that the people that are doing diagnostics at CompUSA or some kind of computer store, they're the only people that care that this thing has got a smart you know, server in it. That's all they need. They will find value to it. So it's why when people get so excited about 
HTML5, and then, well, you can't do this, you can't do this. It's like, to a certain extent, I'm calling this micro-functionality. HTML5 today is perfectly capable of handling the, inter handling the interface needs of all these products. Micro-functionality requires micro-expressivity. We don't need to work that much, so you change the game. You don't have to be as good as native. You don't need to be as good as native when you're dealing with small, smart, little devices. The next point is dealing with this idea of once you kind of get like this interactive soul, once you can kind of make a device have some interactivity that you can kind of export out of it, it's kind of like in Harry Potter when the Dementors came along and sucked the soul out of a body. You want to just suck the interactive soul out of your smart toaster. That's a Toaster Ghost, by the way, in case you missed that really clever animation. Um, and the intention here is that now that I have this interactivity outside of the device, every device in my house can have access to it without installing it. I can use it on my watch, I can use it on my TV, I can use it. So it changes the game entirely. So I can use my phone right in front of the device, I can use my TV from across the room, and I can use my laptop across the city. In fact, once you start to have this kind of exp you know, uh, expressivity, I call this, in fact, um, liberated interactivity. And it's a tremendously, tremendously powerful concept because once the interactivity becomes kind of outside of the device, I can use it in many ways. I mean, it even goes to the point of the uh, interactive bus stop I talked about. Yes, I can use it when I'm right next to the bus stop, but I can also use it within Google Maps. So I'm looking at a bus stop in another city, and I can take a look at that bus stop and see when the bus is coming, or its schedule, or whatever like that. So there's something, there's a huge leveraging capability you get when you liberate interactivity. The third point, which I think is kind of a little boring, but I don't want to miss it, you know, discount, because manufacturers will rip this out of our hands, because you will, a it's actually that, Putting interactivity, the microprocessor, is actually the cheapest part of adding smarts to a device. You've got to punch cut all these holes, put in all these switches, you've got to write this horrible fixed operating system that's in the device that will never ever get updated, you've got to write a horrible manual in 16 languages, and then you've got to have a tech support line that takes cranky phone calls. I mean, this is just a really painful thing, and what's currently happening, of course, is you get this. We're already seeing this happen. This device does kind of two, three things. It shows you the temperature and it changes, the t you know, changes it. That's all it does. But it has the app to do everything else. So this device becomes significantly cheaper to make. So I think there's a tremendous value in kind of liberating the functionality from smart devices. So how do we proceed? How do we do this? The first thing we've got to do is we have to break out of what I call the browser ghetto. I am so tired of us trying to live within what is effectively an operating system emulator inside of another operating system. You have to kind of imagine if you had to run a Cocoa app on the Macintosh and you had to run the Cocoa browser first. It's kind of dumb, right? Well, that's what we have to do. It's, it, the user shouldn't have to care whether it's web or not. So to have to go to a browser just seems really backwards. So the more I play with it, the more constrained it feels. So we've got to you know, figure out how to get that out. So what do I mean by breaking out? Um, here is the poster child of Ajax, or you know, HTML5, you know, you know, Gmail. And everyone gets so excited about talking about what goes inside the window that we don't really talk about what happens here in the actual Omnibox. It's actually, our browser is really two different worlds. There's this awesome Ajaxy thing below, but we have this little type-in area that we've really kind of forgotten exists, but it is the core of why the web is so awesome on the desktop, because I type one letter, and it offers a website to me, it offers a search mode, it offers a search that I've done recently, and then various websites. Most people I know don't use bookmarks anymore because this thing has gotten so awesome. And to a certain extent, this is why I think Chrome OS does well, or why we like the web so much, because we're really good at using this bar. It's really kind of become, in many ways, our command line. That the browser really is driven by a command line interface to get us to this really cool interactive thing. And I'm a, it's always really surprised me that we don't really realize that we have a very old school thing tied to a very new school thing, and yet we have no trouble crumpling this thing up and sticking it into a phone and thinking it's going to be awesome. It, even though you can still type on a phone, I'm not saying you can't, and I'm not saying that people aren't using the mobile web, the 
awesome speed and intensity that we have on the desktop doesn't translate to the mobile phone because of the value pain problem. It's just a little bit harder to do. We've got to figure out how to do, we've got to be able to be better than a command line on mobile. So what I'm trying to do, my big push is to say, we need to have what's called a discovery service on our phone. That is the innovation that we need to really liberate mobile. We have right now four primary sensors, and there will be a fifth, and there will be a sixth, and I don't want to have to worry about that. The phone operating system should be responsible of each, taking each one of these sensors and finding the dozen or hundred devices that are nearby that I can kind of do something with, and then send that, all that data up to the cloud and then rank it like Google would rank. So we then have, effectively, what are the four things that I most likely want to deal with. And of course, it's the best guess, and if it's wrong, I'll go to the next four and then the next four. But in many ways, Google and Bing and Yahoo are all trying to search everything in the world. I want to just search the things around me. And in fact, I would argue this is the next Google. This is the next opportunity to realize what is the space around me. And it's a very profound service. I think it'll be very, very useful. And it's probably a very good startup opportunity. But let me talk to you about how specifically, because right now I've been kind of pontificating and talking about it. Let me actually give you a physical manifestation of what this should be like. The intention here is every mobile phone today has a certain notification manager bar we can use. Now, by the way, I am not saying that we're going to spend the rest of our lives walking around with phones, right, doing this kind of stuff. Phones is just our first tool. Obviously, we've got really cool things like the Google Clear that's coming up. So any smart device would use this, but I'm going to start with the phone because we know that, right? So in the phone, we have a notification bar we pull down, and it just says, here, you have a new SMS. And that's what we know today. What's really important is that this cannot be beeping in my pocket every time I pass a smart device. I will go nuts, right? This has only got to be on demand when I want it. So instead of having just SMSs, say I'm at breakfast, and I pull it down, and I see, OK, there's my Toyota in the driveway. That's my wife. That's her phone. And that's my stereo. And when I click on them, I don't really care. Let's assume that it launches a web page. But I, I can turn on my stereo, I can turn it off. I, if it's cold outside, I can warm my car up and start it. And my wife will have some portal page that displays whatever she, ever she thinks is important. So it's just simply a little gateway to see what's around me. I want to interact. Let's take something a little bit more interesting. I actually am in Paris. I'm in front of the Louvre. I pull it down, and I can see the nearest metro station. I can see the nearest bus stop, the Louvre itself and I happen to be standing next to a crepe stand, and it can just tell me the prices of things. So the intention is that this is just in time. I just want to be able to do one little action. I want pain to be as low as possible. If you notice, there's no app store. There's no searching. There's no installing. There's no deleting. I'm just, what's nearby? Do it. That's what I'm trying to get at here. So what I've done is I've actually, well, the trick is, how do we get this in phones? How do we make this happen? And this is why I'm coming to these conferences and talking, because this is a big shift. We have to figure out how to make it happen. Um, what I would love to have happen is to have a new phone operating system have this built in. And if, if Google had any guts, they'd make a Chrome phone, but they don't. It's just profoundly disturbing to me. Um, they, they're just too enamored with, with Android. But fortunately, we have two contenders coming right now. We've got, this is boot to Gecko which is coming along, and there's also Tizen. And one of the big issues that we have is that these, uh, most likely, these devices are going to do exactly what Horace said. They're going to do this frontal assault. They're going to be exactly trying to be a better iPhone, and they will fail if that's what they're doing, because they're just trying to do technical plumbing at a user level, and they're not going to get it. We have to figure out how to make a other types of services. I'm not at all saying that the only way for these things to be successful is to do my little idea. All I'm saying is, let's try to think outside the box, and discovery service is one approach. Uh, so what I have done, actually, is I have an application that I'm happy to show you that I got a programmer at Frog to help me write, which basically looks for every Wi-Fi hotspot and every Bluetooth hotspot that's nearby. And all I'm really doing is I'm hacking the SSID. And if the name of the device is star star friendly name, star star bitly shortcode, if any named device has that name, I find it, strip it away, and just show the friendly name on the screen. And I tap on it, it just takes me to the website. That's all it does. And um, it's really quite fun. And we discovered so many things in doing this. First of all, we discovered that you can't write this in iOS, because iOS doesn't let you find every Wi-Fi hotspot. We also found out that Bluetooth sucks rocks. 
Bluetooth is a pain in the ass to work with. Um, and the other thing is that we started seeing interesting ways in which this could be used because, in a sense, what we had just invented accidentally was Wi-Fi QR codes, right? So if you could imagine a little wall plug that all it did was broadcast a Wi-Fi SSID, no connectivity, nothing. It just broadcast one of these friendly names. You could probably build that for 10 bucks. Stick that in a, Yelp could give these away to every, you know, every thing. So instead of seeing the sign that says, we're in the app store, you'd just say, open your phone. And here we are. So you could actually kickstart this with a little $10 device. The other idea is that we, could, we, we were playing around at work and we were hacking our Bluetooth names, which you can only do on Android devices, but, uh, so that every phone can be discoverable as well. So all these ideas came out of how we could kind of kickstart this economy. In fact, that's the biggest problem is this is the, I will admit this right up front. This is a big idea, and I'm out here talking about it to figure out how to make it happen. And I will tell you its biggest problem. The biggest problem is that you have to have this ecosystem of devices listening, and you have to have these devices broadcasting. And if you don't have a just-in-time ecosystem, it won't kick off. You have a chicken or the egg problem. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. How can we make this happen? How do we kickstart it? So in going forward and thinking about the future, it's really easy to be kind of blinded by the giant of the day. You're kind of hiding in their shadow. We kind of made a joke at Frog that about three or four years ago, everybody wanted a phone. And every phone had to be black and shiny. We called it the Darth Vader complex. Because every phone company wanted a black, shiny phone. And right now, everyone can only think in terms of the iPhone. Are we really going to be using iPhones 30 years from now? I mean, Bill Buxton talks about, he's a UX designer, a pretty famous guy that talks about the fact that every major innovation, bitmap displays, mouse, touch displays, they were all invented 20 years before they were made successful. It just took that long for people to play with them, to figure them out, to make them cost effective. And sometimes for someone like Apple, yes, to figure out how to do them in a simple way. And part of my job here is to say, Yes, I'm the kind of guy that believes in terraforming, but we have to start talking about these ideas now if we want Tizen to do something. So actually, speaking of which, I went down to Mozilla last week and I talked to Pascal Finette, and I said, can I write this you know, in Butugeko? And he said, in two months you will. We're almost ready. So I'm going to start to write this. I'm, I'm going to write this as a sub... I'm not going to fork Butugeko for God's sakes, but I'm going to write a little app that's going to try to move this along and at least prove the concept. But we have to kind of start to talk about what we want. If you don't know what you want, that's what you get. And we have to start talking about these alternative ideas. So what is our perspective? In summary, what I'm trying to say is that apps basically prevent just-in-time interaction. This is the superpower of the web. What made me send out a little email to a bunch of Google engineers and got 90,000 points in an you know, hour is what makes the web so amazing. If you get pain down to zero, people will do the trivial things in instantly. That is the superpower of what mobile can do. And we've got to figure mobile web can do. And we've got to figure out how to harness that. We also have to realize that we have trapped ourselves into a command line interface approach to mobile on the browser. We've got to break out of that and create a discovery service like the next Google. And if we do that, we will have our flanking maneuver. We will allow mobile to be something truly much, much better than native. So I hope to talk to you guys about it. I want you guys to poke holes in this. I want to argue. I want to make this better. So please grab me afterwards and talk. Power to the people. Thank you. Oh, I can, I, we have time. I can take some questions. If anybody has any questions. Okay. Yes, sir. So, Scott, um, the 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 part where you had the the toaster coming out, the the ghost, the inner, and I can't remember you called it interactivity. Um, Liberator interactivity. Yeah, I I didn't quite understand like what the toaster was going to be doing in that scenario. Can you explain yeah, sure. a little bit more? I, uh, whether it's a toaster or your security system, um, again, it's this idea of 
it's, it's possibly fairly trivial stuff. So I, in, in my Triumph of the Mundane article, I talked about the fact that it could be as simple as simply logging its electrical usage. So every device in my house now just logs its electrical usage, but I could change the toaster done sound. I could possibly just see how many times it's been used. I, could, I think that the toaster was probably a bit of a joke, you know, but I do feel, the, the other example about the toaster, actually this is a good point, I actually talked about the fact that I think an awful lot of manufacturers would kill for two simple things. If a device could just simply provide me with a link, a couple of YouTube videos that lets me kind of understand how to use it, so I could then have effectively a manual built into the device, and then I could actually do tech support calls directly, it would allow me to effectively have a digital manual built right into every device. So even that, which is unbelievably trivial, I think would be very valuable to manufacturers. You just provide a little chip that basically allows me to kind of interact and learn about my product. So that's probably the best example, because who really wants to program their toaster, right? But having nothing but tech support, I think, is a huge advantage to products. Probably you, the most complicated thing on a toaster is changing the crumb tray, right? So probably you want to do a little bit more than that. So, yeah, Steve. Thanks for the talk. That was a really great talk. It Thanks. was a good way to start the day. I thought it was really important um, what you said about lowering the barrier. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we garden our phones and we get old apps off the phone. And, um, you know, it's just painful for me to create folders of apps and it, it's just overwhelming. Um, oh, and I also wanted to say, in our house, one person keeps changing the level of the toaster. Uh, to be darker than what everyone else wants. There and so you go. That would be a great app where you just walk up and it automatically sets the level to the one that you prefer. Um, so I, I think that lowering the barrier, you know, getting rid of apps um, would be really good. But another, uh, and I think it's a great talk, but I just want to say I would actually kind of not enjoy the point where we got to where rather than walk up and ask the crepe vendor how much the crepes cost, we're just doing, we're just living life and inter interacting with the world, not 100%, but to mm -hmm. a much higher degree through our phones. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess I don't really have a question, just an observation or what you think about that, about, you know, already I feel like we and my kids are living too much through these devices. Is this gonna make that even more so no, I think you're right. You, it, every technology can be used in a silly way. And so if the guy has the price right there on the pole, and I'm gonna say, no, I'm gonna look at it on my phone. I mean, that's silly, right? But hot dog vendors in New York are already using Twitter to tweet where they're going to be, right? So there are things that you want to be able to find out that you, because you're not necessarily right in front of him, or you want to be able to find out where he's gonna be next. And maybe the hot dog stand is maybe a bit of a silly example, but I do believe that we're going to be able to provide this extra level of stuff, hopefully more than just simply the menu. So um, I think it's going to kind of depend on the situation. So. Well, that, that one's obviously more valuable because it actually, uh, the bus example flips the whole thing on its head, right? Instead of buying the bus app for San Francisco, and then picking the bus line and picking where I am, and I drill, 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 drill. I walk up to the node that I want, and I say, this is the 13 bus, and this is five minutes. So that's a lot more valuable. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, though, that as we play around with this, the, um, the crep guy won't have his prices, but he might have testimonials, right? He might have anything that kind of makes you want to buy it, because the one thing you can't do is taste it before you buy it. And so there are going to be PR-type values to these things that just make it more interesting and more fun. So, yes? Is it on? Yeah. Now it's on, yeah. This is a little comment on the talk. Great, great talk, by the Thank way. Uh, I think uh, it might be necessary to empathize a little bit more, though, that uh, it's not just, it's not the just the case that it's a little processor in every of these smart devices. It's, it's the network connection that becomes the universal hardware access point. So just as important as the little processor is the little network chip. Right, but the, like, the Nordic chip I talked about for 25 cents already has a Bluetooth stack in it. Mm. So it's getting to be fairly cheap to do that. 
Yeah. Right. And also, we, there's, once you start to think about this, you realize that you have a whole topology of networking. In other words, right now, the current system that I have working, I can only talk to the, the cloud thing. If it wants to talk to the device, it has to take care of it itself. The next step in this prototype is to actually connect directly to the device itself. And if it has, a, for example, there's a, a USB stick I have called AirStash. It's a lovely little USB storage stick that has a built-in media browser built into it so I can connect to it and browse. Um, that's only 100 bucks. And so the idea is I can kind of connect straight to the device, and it doesn't need connectivity to the world. It only needs connectivity to me. So I think there's going to be a whole range of things we can talk about here. Oh, thank you. Um, I have... Um yeah, actually I have two, but I uh, decided on uh, one question. Um, how do you envision uh, discovering uh, things that are not uh, nearby? Uh, so when I no. want to uh, look up uh, the, uh, the bus schedule in San Francisco while I'm in Amsterdam, how could that, uh, that, how could that work? Well, that's, that one's particularly easy. I can imagine harder questions. That one you could just simply imagine that Google Maps just, you know, has, Google Maps has the same database as my phone could have. So using Google Maps, I would just zoom in in San Francisco, and I'd find the corner, I'd see the bus stop, I'd click on it, it would load that web page. Right? So the other part, I think the more interesting question would be, I want to access my home security system from work. Okay, that's the harder one, because I am nowhere near my home security system. And I think that there's, there's got to be a couple of conversations around here. One is, uh, depending on the ranking system, the system might say you always use it, so I'll, I'll offer it to you, but that's probably asking for too much. At some point, though, you probably are going to want to do like what Google does, is that you star certain things. You know, and you know, but, but that's different. There's like six, 10, 12, 20 things that are really important to me, and I am going to save. You know, and so I will save those. And then as I walk through the world, then I will swim through those devices. And so there clearly has to be some type of bookmarking mechanism. So I absolutely agree that this discovery is just the first thing. And then, because the home security or whatever is the obvious case for that. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Thank you. Please give him a warm hand.